I wanted to get up here and say some nice things about Brother Reagan and call his wife, call his hey, brother, huh. call his brother. I know he has a sister. No, I tell you, I have a lot of good things to say about him when we first talked. It was kind of funny. He comes from down and out around my country. Grew up there in Colorado. And I preached for 11 years just south of there. Just uh, and for 11 years just close to his home. And we went to some same school, same places. And uh, I was impressed with him when I found out he had even preached in one town in Oklahoma. I won't tell you which one it was. Amen. But I, I, had a, I, I had a gospel meeting there. And, uh, and then a few years, a lot of years later, he moved there for a, a located work. It was a, sh a short town, so he only stayed there for a short while. <laughs> but he said, you never heard of that town? And I said, oh, you mean the one where the church sent to the, the house? I told him where the house sat. And I said, hey, did they ever get the oil out of that back bedroom with that motorcycle leak there? And, and he said, you've been here before, haven't you? <laughs> well, I say that because he and I had been there before. He had been in some places that was rough to walk, and I had to. He has seen some great people, and I had to. And he and I both agree that this group of people, the group of preachers we have today, are great. Amen. We are looking forward. I'm glad he helped me and can help me do this. And I respect him very much. We meet quite often. If we get a change in our busy schedule, we'd like to meet on Monday, he and his wife and my wife. And as you fellowship with him, you will find out more and more that he has a good wife. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Go ahead. Preach to him. <laughs> Oh, Brother Jess. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Amen. We'll get her later. <laughs> well, I, I do appreciate that you've given me more credit than I deserve. Uh, I don't even remember what led to it. But you know, I've, I've grown weary in the church. Over the separation that continues between us. <clears throat> you know, and I, I joked with Tyler, he's my youth minister, and my wife, and the others who understand my sense of humor. I said, I said, I think I'll get up here and tell every racial joke I ever heard. <laughs> and then we'll find out who's got thick hides. <laughs> And my wife said, you do that, Brother Mark and Tommy are there. They'll be having a meeting with you on your way home. <laughs> but you won't be preaching come Sunday. Uh, amen. <laughs> but you know, Brother Jess and I, we got talking about lectureships and how it's always the same big names. And all they do is come together and congratulate each other on how wonderful they are at being wonderful about doing nothing about their church's dying and the brotherhood dying. And they got nothing to offer to us. But as I got to looking at the area, see, where I grew up, there was no black people. You grew up on the eastern plains of Colorado, they didn't go black folk when I grew up. We had Mexicans, and we had German, and we had Irish. And the German and the Irish, we didn't like each other. You said, but y'all white. No, they're different kind of white than Germans. <laughs> oh, all right. But when I got to Alabama as a youth minister, a wonderful group of brethren I worked with, we used to chew tobacco together for church services. My elders and I, we'd chew tobacco and spit and chew tobacco and spit. And I was out evangelizing one day and I came across a fine young gentleman. And I said, you should come to the congregation where I'm the youth minister. And he said, what, what, what church is that? Because in Florence, Alabama, like 90% of the churches are Church of Christ. And I said the name of the congregation. He said, oh, that's the church where black people don't go. Take your call. Yes, sir. Thank you. And you know, I was 
a little bit baffled about that because <clears throat> growing up where there was no black people, <laughs> that all we had was Mexicans and whites. This thing between blacks and whites was foreign to me. I didn't understand it. He said, oh, I knew all the jokes. <laughs> it's like I told my youth minister. I said, when I was a kid coming up, I said, if there was a joke about a Polak, we told it. I said, every race was fair game to be made fun of when I was a kid. I said, we told jokes about our own. I said, but you know, I said, but nobody cared. That could have been because we was all white that we didn't care. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, I got to looking around here. And I start seeing all the quote black congregations yeah. and all the quote white congregations. And that got on my nerves. And I looked just and I said, why don't we have a Crimson Fellowship? I said, instead of all these dumb lectureships where we all come together, pat each other on the back and say how wonderful we are, why don't we get some brother from the black church, some brother from the white church, <laughs> I said, why don't we come together as the family of God under the only color that matters, and that's the crimson color of his blood. Amen. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts, chapter 17, because we're going to talk about some racist people. Hmm. And you're going to say, Brother Brian, I've been in Acts before. I didn't know there was racism in there. Well, it's there. And we're going to attack it in a way that we ain't never attacked it tonight. Because there are some things in this world I hate, and I hate idolatry. And we're going to attack a sacred idolatry tonight. Because, brothers and sisters, it is beyond high time that we quit letting the devil divide the family of God. Amen. And so we find ourselves in the book of Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 16. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? And other some, he seems to be a center for the strange gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. You realize you and I take the resurrection for granted, but in the ancient world, that was a secret doctrine. All of the so-called mystery religions of the Egyptians and everybody else, nobody else knew that there was a concept of resurrection. But when Jesus Christ came, the whole world knew that there was a way to come back and conquer death. But when Paul was preaching it, they said, he must be of some strange doctrine. And they took him and they brought him into the area <coughs> saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you bring certain strange things to our ears, and we would know therefore these things, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now, I like the old King James on that. Let's not call idolatry very religious. You're too superstitious. Amen. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he given life to all and breath and all things. And he has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, and happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are his offspring, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the God of heaven is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance, the times of this 
ignorance. Yeah. I want you to see they were in a time of ignorance. And I'm here to tell you right now that in our day and time, for all the knowledge that we think we have, we're some of the dumbest people that have ever walked the face of the earth. We live in a day of ignorance. And we're going to attack that here in just a minute. The times of this ignorance, God once overlooked. But now, He commands all men everywhere to repent. Because, and here's why we need to repent, and we're going to get back to this, Lord willing, if I don't run out of time. Amen, Brother Tommy? If I don't run out of time. <laughs> because He hath appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He has ordained, whereof He has given assurance unto all men that He has raised Him from the dead. I want to talk to you tonight. I want to talk to you about our unity and our identity in the one blood. You know, the Gospel of Luke records that our lineage goes back to Adam. The lineage of Christ goes back to Adam. Every one of us sitting here right now is descended from either Ham, Shem, or Japheth. We go back to great-grandpa Noah. He said, well, we all go back to Adam. Yes, we do. You know, as I got to looking at that thing about one blood. Now, depending upon what Bible you have, your Bible might not have the word blood in it. Some people decided, they said, well, we don't like the textual evidence. We voted it out. So they changed it and they said, from one man. I don't really care. Because that one man had blood. And that blood was one blood. And you know, there's only one blood. Now you say, wait no, brother. There's, there's more than one blood. No, no, no. You know, I got studying this. All blood is based off of O-type blood. Type A blood has one kind of a sugar molecule on it. Type B blood has a different kind. And type AB picks up A and B. I guess it can't make up its mind. <laughs> but when God started this thing out, that's why anybody, anybody can take O. But O can't take anything but O. Because if you if you anything but O, you and I got the contaminated blood. Yeah. I found out I'm A positive. That means I'm real positive that O's and B's can't handle my blood. <laughs> Amen. 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 And you're right. The more you visit with me, the more you find out what a wonderful wife I have. <laughs> Amen. But it started in Adam. It started with that blood. That blood that led to rebellion. That blood that led to murder of the first blood. Of their eldest son killing their youngest son. And from that time forward, we have marched on. And then we get to the Tower of Babel. We come to the Tower of Babel. And we find this ignorance. We find this ignorance. We find first an arrogance. You see, arrogance has to precede ignorance. When we think we are too smart. When we say, I know more than God. We say, I've got signs. I've got a cell phone. Oh, I know it all. Because I can look up and play an app on my phone. I'm a genius. No, you a slave. Huh? You a slave. You're owned by somebody in an office building that you ain't ever seen that they control in your life with a piece of electronics that you pay in them to control you. But it's the arrogance that precedes the ignorance. And at Babel, you remember, they said, we're going to build us a tower and we're going to ascend to where God is. We're going to take Him down. And he said, oh, brother, I don't know about that. No, I do. It was Nimrod, who was one of Ham's boys. And Ham was a bad boy. I don't know what was wrong with Ham. He didn't get off that boat too long until he did some bad stuff. We ain't going to go into that tonight. That's a different sermon for a different time. When it's all only no G-rated kids. Because you can't tell the story of Ham G-rated. And Nimrod was one of his. And so God scattered the nations. He scattered their languages. He scattered their races. He scattered the languages and he scattered the races. And we fast forward to the time of Moses. The first time we have two 
God-ordained races. There was the Hebrew and everyone else. Brother Gaston, I want you to know tonight, brother, you and me, we're part of the everything else. <laughs> I know we have different colors. I'm part of the purple people. I'm the last one left alive, my brother, because there was a one-horned, one-eyed, flying purple people leader and he took out the rest of them. Now I say that in some humor. But I want you to think about this idolatry of race. Have you thought about race as idolatry? If I say something about the Mexican, how dare you? If I say something about the black man or the black woman, you say, oh no, brother, you must say African American. I'm here to tell you, my racial heritage, genetically, is Irish-ish. <laughs> but I want you to understand this. The people in Ireland, they don't want our kind back. They only want us as tourists. John Wayne, a long time ago, had a speech about the, uh, the hyphen. Some of y'all have heard it. He said, a hyphen is used to divide. And I want to propose something that, that addresses this because when you and I, if we as Americans go anywhere else in the world, they don't care what the color of your skin is. They only know you're an American. They either love you or they hate you because you're an American. They don't see our colors the way we see our colors. They see us as American. And it doesn't matter. And I, we can't undo the past. The only thing we can do is work off where we're at. Amen. And we've let the government of men divide us. You see, I'm not a pure old American. I ain't never been to Europe. I got. Other than to go to Ireland, if my wife wants me to go to Ireland and she can arrange a trip at a price that I can afford, I ain't going to Ireland. You know, I think I'm probably 82% Mexican, baby. Because my heart stays in my heart stays in Texas, which is North Mexico. And if I could, I'd eat Mexican food 10 days a week. You are Irish, you think there's 10 days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But when did we let the children of the devil define our identity? You see, because in Christ Jesus, we have a new man and a new blood. You get down and you sit down now. Thank you. Go sit down. In Christ Jesus, we have a new man and we have a new blood. I guess Philippians 3.20 reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven. I'm glad I'm an American. But you know, before there was an America, there was other things. And after America is no more, the only thing that's going to matter is, is your name, is my name, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. That's it. I know, I know I'm talking to a bunch of preachers, but for all y'all that ain't preachers, if you would have been born in a city back in ancient times, your name would have been recorded by the city clerk in the book of that city. And that was your citizenship, that was your identity. And if your name was stricken, blotted out, it was as though you had never existed. And so when I say, is your name in the Lamb's book of life, I mean, does the Lamb say you're one of his citizens? Hmm. Because if you are, if your citizenship is in heaven, then you have a family. You know, I was adopted as a baby. 1973, abortion became legal. I was adopted that year. Nine days old, I went to my new, my new family. 
So for me, family has always been about choice. It's not been about biology. And the Apostle Paul says to us in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, he said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now what name is it that you want to go by? You know, Tyler, Tyler, you weren't there, were you? Yeah, you were. The discipleship Christian conversation. Yeah. We go to this breakfast thing sometimes. They're in town. This old boy from another church. He got up and said, we shouldn't be worried about being called Christian so much. We should be more worried about being disciples. Wow. And he got to ask for comments at the end. Now, some of y'all, I bet you guess where my comment went. I said, Acts 11 says that it's called Christians first in Antioch. And the apostle by the Holy Spirit says, if any man suffer, let him suffer as a Christian. I said, he didn't say suffer as a disciple. He said, suffer as a Christian. You suffer for the family name. Brother Gaskin, your name is Christian. You don't know your first name yet. Because he hasn't given it to you. When we get there, we get our eternal name. Amen. I, don't, I mean, I'm happy with pride. But Jesus has my name written down. I don't know what it is. He knows what it is. And my name's going to be something Christian. All of us going through eternity, the angels are going to know. They're going to say, oh, you're one of those Christians. You're one of the ones bought with the blood of the Lamb. And when we get there, because the only government will be the true government. The government that Grandpa Adam just could not abide. Government with the Father in full fellowship and unity with the Godhead. And we won't fill out forms to make men happy and check a box where someone says this is what your identity is. You know, for years I've been checking the box other. <laughs> you say, serious? Yeah, because on that box when they put white, I look at my skin and I look at this, I look at the page in my Bible and I go, well that looks like white to me and that don't look like my skin so I, I guess I ain't white. <laughs> and then someone said, well you Caucasian. I said, my people didn't come from the mountains of Turkey, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, my people are Celtic so I've been writing Celtic on forms for years. <laughs> I ain't going to fit no government box. I am not going to let the children of the devil who divide us as a nation further divide it and bring it into the family of God and try and use their classifications to divide us. And the fact that you can't speak against it is because race is a false god. Yes. And people worship at it. People die for it. Presidents divide it. Law enforcement divides it. Everybody divides over it. And the only thing it does is when we worship at that idol, tell me what it brings. It brings hatred. It brings strife. It brings division. It brings murder. But Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ, Hebrews says, we see man made a little bit lower than angels, but we see Jesus. And I want to ask you today, do you see Jesus? Because there is one nation, and that's the Christian nation, that's the heavenly nation. There's one family, and that's the Father's family, from whom everyone in heaven and earth is named. There is one mystery, Ephesians 3 tells us, and that mystery was that Jew and Gentile both would be able to partake of God. And the last time I checked, I'm looking at a bunch of Gentiles. You know, you and I got in on the same thing as the Jews. Hallelujah. That's right. Oh, yeah. And there's one blood. One blood. And there's only one blood that matters. You know, if you sit down and you read Chronicles, or Tyler and I, we've read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, we're partway through Deuteronomy, we read Bible together in the mornings. Before we start our day ministry wise, I want you to think of all the blood 
that was shed from the time that Moses gave those commands until Jesus Christ died on that cross. That's a lot of blood. How many millions upon millions upon millions of goats and sheep and oxen but the blood of Jesus <laughs> across time and space and nation and race is greater than all that. First John 5, 8 says that there's three that bear witness, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Isn't it an interesting thing that when you and I go down in the water of baptism, we are covered with his blood and the Holy Spirit baptizes us into his church. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. I know you know it. But he told them to watch out, to look over the flock which he has purchased with his own blood. We are a blood-bought people. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. The Word of God there says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. When was the last time you were told, do you have faith in the blood of Jesus? I said, well, brother, I don't, think I, I don't think I really thought about what I believe about the blood of Jesus. You need to have faith in that blood. Yes, that blood is what makes you clean. Yes, you know, when we take communion, and I know y'all know this, but I like to say the obvious over and over again. You know, my, my family tells me I like to say the obvious. If you're a preacher and your family hasn't told you that you'd like to state the obvious, then I don't know. <laughs> but when you and I take that bread, that bread is in is the, is the emblem of his body in which he took the punishment for our sins. The fruit of the vine, which is the emblem of his blood, is what takes away the guilt of it. And so when someone doesn't think about the faith in his blood, and you got to have faith in that blood. Because when you and I kneel down in prayer and we ask him to cleanse us, to forgive us, 1 John tells us what? That he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he tells us. Ephesians 1, 7 tells us that we are redeemed through his blood. And then Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether things in earth or things in heaven. You know, my hope, my heart, is that what we kick off here tonight starts something. Not that the big dogs and the big universities and the big churches catch hold of. Revival never did start in the big churches. Revival always starts in the country churches. Revival always starts in the small places. His blood. I had a brother in Christ there in Texas. He was black. Me and him didn't get along. He drove a Chevy. I drove a Dodge. <laughs> and every time he come in church, he talked about my Dodge and how it wasn't a good truck. And one day he called me and said, Can you tow my truck? <laughs> <laughs> His name was Brian Cottrell. And I looked at him, I said, son, I said, I didn't go use Irish. I said, you must be dark Irish. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I knew when we left Texas? That I loved Brian and Brian loved me. And if I'd have called him at 2 in the morning in Louisiana and said, brother. And that's all I'd have said to him is brother. <coughs> Because Brian knew what we all know. And that is 
There's one name. There's one family. There's one color. You know, Paul said the times of this ignorance God once overlooked. I want to ask you, when were we in the church? Quit being ignorant. You see, Scripture tells us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And Satan has used everything he can to divide the children of God. And it is beyond high time that we preach the Word of God without apology. We preach the unity of the fellowship of the blood of Christ without apology, without compromise. That we do not make these ridiculous stands where we stand and hold each other's arms and go, we're united. No, no, that's not unity. Unity is when we sit down and we share meals. Unity is when we go over and you say, you know, brother, I need help building my fence. And you say, well, I need help, you know, pouring some concrete. And I said, brother, let's work together. We, I'll help you, you help me. I'll help you because Christ helped me. You helped me because Christ helped you. And we both help one another. And we'll be a witness. Because there are certain idols in this country that need to be torn down. Now I won't touch the idol of football. Because we in it. <laughs> But how many people divide over a team? Amen. How many people divide over color of skin? How many people divide over language? The Athenians believed that they were the master race. I don't know how many of y'all knew that. They believed they were the master race. They thought they were the first ones that God had sprouted. And that everything else was inferior. And when Paul walked in and he said the times of this ignorance, he wasn't just talking about their statues. He was talking about their arrogance. Because in their arrogance they had become stupid. They had built a statue of everything they could imagine. And for what they could not imagine, they built one of the unknown God, which has got to be one of the dumbest things you can ever do. We don't know what we worship, but we're going to build a statue to it just in case we miss something. Why? Because we're so smart that we don't want to leave anything out and upset them. But the rest of the world must be done. That's the epitome of arrogance. And when you get that arrogant, then you get ignorant. And Paul invited them to repent. He invited them to repent. Well, my time's almost up. Brother, I don't know, you might have longer than your 35 allotted minutes, so I'm going to hopefully give you at least a couple extra. <laughs> kind of like in Congress, I yield two minutes to my, to my fellow speaker. <laughs> but you know, I had a Bible study this afternoon with a couple, and we were in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. And John was preaching, and he told the Sadducees and the Pharisees, repent. When Jesus began his ministry, the first word he said was repent. Repent. Why? For the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And Paul told them the times of this ignorance. It used to be able to get away with it, but now, now, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Red, yellow, black, brown, white. Someone say, you left out a color. I didn't leave out any color. I learned that in my Sunday school. When I went to this one church, my Sunday school teacher, we used to sing the song, Red and Yellow, Black and White. I got there, she said, we sing it different here. She said, we don't want to leave out the brown people. She said, so we sing Red, Yellow, Black, Brown, White. Hmm. I figured it had to be all those Mexican kids she was talking about. But we didn't have no reds or yellows or blacks in that county. Hmm. But you know why we need to repent? Because it started with one blood that went bad. It's been reconciled by one blood that has made it all good. And if we aren't with the blood that makes it good, then you and I are nothing but bad blood on this planet. 
And that's a problem in our world today. It has a world filled with bad blood. So tonight, and I, I know, but tonight I want to ask you to look in your heart. See, racism is easy. I know plenty of black folk who was racist. I went to the church one time. They preached a gospel meeting. I was the only white guy there. Brother got up. He was thundering. And he said, I want to tell you that those crap. Hmm? <laughs> and he paused. Wow. And I knew he was fixing to say cracker. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up and he apologized to me afterward. And I said, why, brother? Huh. I said, don't apologize to me. I said, apologize to the Lord because you got racism in your heart. Amen. Friend of mine, I, I had his wife's father was big in the La Raza movement in California, which is a Mexican racial supremacy movement. The Chinese think they're better than the Japanese, and the Japanese think they're better than everybody. And Jesus Christ says, we're all equally damnable because we're nasty, filthy sinners until we're made clean by his blood. Amen. Amen. And I want to ask you tonight, look in your heart. Because I know this, if I see four black boys walking down the street at two in the morning, or four white boys, I'm going to be more on edge about four white boys. Because I know they ain't nothing no good. And say, how do you know? Because I used to be one of them. But what's the racism that's in your heart? Because it fixes it in the church when it fixes in our heart. And that's what our Lord Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm glad you're here. Let what we start here be something that ripples and starts to bring healing in the blood of Jesus throughout the family of God in all places. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.